I believe it's something that's, that's in all of us, um, even if we don't want to admit it. I mean, I certainly didn't for a very long time. Um, I read about mimetic desire and I thought that it applied to everybody else but me. Uh, I could see it in l literally almost everybody else but me. And that's kind of a funny thing, right? Like why, why would I exempt myself of all the people, right? It's I'm the only one. Um, so I, I think that it does take a certain level of, of, of opening up and acceptance. I'm joined today on the show by Luke Burgess, author of this book, Wanting the Power of Mimetic Desire and How to Want What You Need. Luke, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Good to be here. Well, so I'm brand new to this topic. I saw the book everywhere. I saw great reviews and I was brand new to this topic of mimetic desire. It's not something I'd read about before. I'm brand new and I'm sure a lot of our audience are brand new. So if anyone's out there right now listening, thinking they don't understand, well, neither do I really. So let's start off. Let's define everything as we go along. So what is mimetic desire? So mimetic is a word that simply means imitation. It comes from a Greek word that means to imitate. So mimetic desire is imitative desire. They're desires that we've adopted from somebody else or some group, and we're imitating those desires. Mm -hmm. So this, this idea of mimetic desire comes from a French thinker named René Girard, who sort of looking at human behavior, trying to understand why people make decisions and choose the things that they choose. And he couldn't put his finger on, uh, on sort of some of the mysterious decisions that we make that couldn't be explained by kind of the hard sciences alone. And he realized that there was a part of imitation that nobody had quite realized before. We, we all know that humans are imitative creatures. Um, you know, it's how we learn language. It's how we learn. Uh, I mean, it's how we learn pretty much anything, right? It's like the, it, responsible for the development of culture. But Girard saw that our powers of imitation, unlike animals that also imitate, uh, go far deeper. And we read the intentions of other people. We read beneath the surface of their outward actions and we see what they want and what other people want influences us tremendously. And he called this phenomenon uh, mimetic desire rather than imitative desire. He could have just used a word that we all know because he said that mimesis or mimetic desire is almost always hidden and underground. It's kind of this hidden uh, unconscious aspect of human behavior where we don't want to outwardly show that we're doing it. So you use that word to distinguish it from, you know, the kinds of things that we're happy to imitate, you know, like our favorite football player or, or whatever, or some role model. Mimesis is, is sort of the underground part of our imitative lives. So why is living with awareness of mimetic desire going to benefit the individual? His mimetic desire shapes so, so much of our life, um, you know, from the time that we're, we're children, really. We're assimilating and taking in these ideas from our parents, from our friends that are shaping what we want. Uh, that could be, you know, where we eventually want to go to school. It could be the lifestyle that we're attracted to. It could be, you know, romantic interests, career paths, constantly being shaped by by these mimetic forces without knowing it. And most people um, sort of convince themselves that they have a perfectly rational reason for making the choices that they make. Uh, and Gerard called this the romantic lie. You know, we have a romantic notion um, of our own individuality, of our own rationality, uh, when in fact we're incredibly social. So, you know, having an awareness of the, mod the models of desire that we have in our lives allows us to just gain some, some critical distance from, from the influence that they're having on us and to step back and to be able to choose freely uh, what kind of influences we want on our desires. Um, so, you know, you, you, 
you probably want to distance yourself from, from the people that you don't want to become. Um, cause we're incredibly, incredibly, um, social and there's just a basic, I think a lot of people just sort of take, take it for granted, um, you know, that, um, their desires are completely autonomous and don't fully account for the, for the way in which they're, they're shaped by, by the, by the people and the, the institutions and the industries around them. Is it more important to be as aware as, as we can about this rather than just to try and life hack it away, which a lot of people do with things that they aren't comfortable with? Yeah. You know, I'm not a huge fan of the life hacking approach to, 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 you know, quote, solving this problem. Um, you know, I think that's an, that's a instinct that many people have, you know, like, what can I do about this? What are five easy steps? And for me, you know, this has been more of a long process of bringing it to conscious awareness. And, you know, I don't think that there is some easy hack to it. I really don't. Um, you know, I've many people sort of stumble on this idea of mimetic theory, mimetic desire, and then they realize how much it's driving financial markets and cryptocurrency. And, you know, they see how it contributes to bubbles, right? People want something because somebody else wants something, right? Um, so there are maybe ways that you can take advantage of this knowledge, right? But the most important journey to take, I believe, is being aware of sort of how it affects you at a, at a more profound, deep, deep level in terms of identity, in terms of the, the kind of person that you want to be, far more important than just spotting it everywhere else in, in the world, but seeing how it actually affects, you know, the relationships that, that we're in, um, you know, with people that we love, um, with things that we're pursuing, with why we choose to pursue certain goals in the first place. You know, this is a really important aspect of it. You know, there's a lot of ink spilled over how to achieve your goals and, and, and all of those things. But oftentimes the reason that we adopt the goals in the first place is because they've been sort of mimetically, you know, given to us because other people want something. Um, we end up wanting it as well without giving a whole lot of thought as to why, like, why is that, why is that something that's good for me? I mentioned that this wasn't something I was particularly conscious of until I came across your book. So how did you become aware? Like, what brought it to your attention in your journey? So my journey was, uh, was a long circuitous route. Uh, it took me really until my late twenties to have any kind of awareness of why I felt such whiplash with my own sort of desires and why they changed so frequently. So I worked on wall street for a short period of time. And then I was in California in the startup world for most of my twenties, uh, founding companies, co-founding companies, some successful, some not successful. Um, but one thing that I did notice that the constant was that I could never sort of sustain any real passion or any desire for the things that I was doing. I would get into something and it could be a business or it could be a relationship. And then after a short period of time, I would, my, my desire would, would disappear and I couldn't figure out why. And this is a very disconcerting thing to feel. Um, you know, it's sort of, I got to a point where I was like, I was disillusioned. It was like, why enter another relationship or start another company and put all of this work, all of this time and effort into it, um, only to find myself kind of disillusioned later. I needed to understand sort of the forces that were behind why I wanted the things that I wanted and why it changed. And I had one particular incident. Um, I tell the story in the book of a really blown up business deal. I was trying to basically merge my company with another company. I thought that I, this is the thing that I wanted the most because there were certainly huge financial incentives to this deal going through. Um, you know, I, I, I saw it, you know, it'd be good for on multiple levels, right? So this is the thing that I desired the most and the deal totally fell through at the last minute. Um, and I had the very strange sensation of relief when that happened. And I realized after thinking about it, that the relief was because I felt like I had somehow been freed from some kind of like bondage or something. Mm -hmm. I had been freed from feeling the need to have to achieve this thing. And it happened, you know, not on my own, sort of not on my own accord, right? From circumstances that were outside of my control, this deal got blown up. But it took that for me to see that the reason I had wanted this thing so much was because 
all of the expectations, all of the models of desire that I had in my life, which were mostly fellow entrepreneurs at the time, uh, had, had shaped my desire for this thing to happen. And I realized that it was in tension with the kind of future that I wanted, with the kind of person that I really wanted to be. I found myself taking shortcuts on uh, doing, saying things that I didn't really mean because the overwhelming desire to be a certain kind of entrepreneur and to achieve certain totems or symbols of success had become so important to me that I, I had forgotten some core parts of who I am. Mm -hmm. And it took that blown up deal for me to kind of go back to the drawing board, take some time away, be quiet for once and began to sort of do some interior work and explore what was motivating me. And it was around that time that I came across uh, Rene Girard and it helped me understand not only some of the things that had been going on throughout my twenties, some of the things in the culture, um, some of the things in my relationships uh, and just really, you know, it, it took me a very long time to fully wrap my head around everything that mimetic theory involves, but I knew that it was important at a personal and sort of existential level. And eventually I wrote the book because I thought it was an idea important enough to share uh, because, you know, until this point, every it, it's everything had been sort of very academic. And I was like, no, 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 this, this actually involves like everybody's life. And it's something that everybody should know about. Well, this show is called the freedom pact. How has your work studying desire affected the way that freedom means to you now? Mm. So we could talk about the, the freedom of desire, mm. for instance, and this has given me a new perspective on what that means. You know, the question that I would ask or ask people to think about is, are we free to desire whatever we want? Are we free to desire anything at any time? And I think the answer is no. You know, we, we don't have that sort of absolute freedom to snap our fingers and to want something. Uh, you know, how nice would it be if we could? You know, you have, I don't know, people out there that have fallen out of love with their spouses or something like that, right? Or, or that, that want to get into better shape. Um, or that want to kick a really bad habit and they, but they don't want it enough or, or they, or, or maybe they, they've realized that there are certain things that they should want that they don't want. And the desire is, is not something that they can just generate. It's not something that I can just conjure up on my own. Um, the desire itself takes work and has to be shaped and influenced by the people in my life. Like if I don't have a, if I, if I want some, if I, if I think that something is important and valuable, but there are no other models of desire for that thing in my life, I'm going to have a very, very hard time uh, actually having any kind of sustained desire to achieve it. So uh, I, if we have free will and we, we're, we're free people, but our freedom is not absolute. You know, our freedom is, is, is bounded in some ways um, so our freedom is, you know, our, our freedom is a, is kind of a precarious thing because I believe that freedom can be won or lost. You know, we can become more or less free in our lives based on the decisions that we make based on the people that are around us. Um, so it's, it's sort of given me a more nuanced view of the kinds of freedom that, that I have, um, and made me think pretty seriously about, you know, how our, how, how, what am I going to, what, what I'm going to want next year, or maybe even what I'm going to want tomorrow is the product of a process of the things that I want today. Um, you know, it's sort of in, in some sense, our desires are path dependent. And part of the process for me has been looking seriously at my life and seeing the way that my desires have been shaped and thinking about what, what that means for my future. Outside of things like food, water, warmth, a roof over your head, is there any wants that you think we have where mimesis isn't present at all in any way? You, so you mentioned sort of things that I would call largely, you know, biological needs, right? Yeah. You know, if I'm, 
really thirsty. I want something to drink. I'm really hungry. I want something to eat. Cold. I want to be warm. Roof over my head. Um, those things, though, today, in 2021, when we're having this conversation, uh, are also largely shaped by mimesis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think about it, you know, it's, it's now if I want water, I've got, you know, a thousand different choices of, of the kinds of water that I'm going to drink. So I think there are, there may be certain things that aren't mimetic in any way that are not the product of, of what other people want. But I think those things are probably few and far between, um, really few and far between because so much of our world that we live in, for most people, we live in, in a world of abundance where most people are not waking up every day, um, you know, worried about surviving until the end of the day in terms of, you know, um, I mean, many people are, but, but many people are spend most of their time thinking about desires rather than needs. Um, and this is why it's so important to understand the role that mimetic desire plays. Um, you know, this is a, it's a point of contention within people that know Rene Girard really well. It's like, well, is all desire mimetic or is most desire mimetic? Uh, I sort of fall in the camp that, you know, most I th desires I think are mimetic, but probably not all. Um, you know, I, I think we do a lot of things, you know, I, there's certainly a, a strong basis for attraction that's just grounded in sort of physiological things. Right. Um, so I think sometimes initial movements towards something uh, are not mimetic, but then they can become mimetic. So, you know, to give you an example of that, you know, I'm just uh, incredibly attracted, you know, to, to a woman um, and that, that, that attraction, you know, I don't need any model for that whatsoever, right? It's kind of like on first sight, right? Um, and, you know, pursue her. And I don't think that there's anything mimetic about that, right? I mean, it could be that like, my ideas of beauty or my idea of like what makes a woman attractive have been given to me in some way um, through the culture or through my friends. Right. So in that sense, maybe, maybe that's why that attraction is there in the first place. But I think, you know, I can make a strong case that, that, that it need not be right. It could just be like, I'm just, I'm attracted by what I see enter into relationship or, or, or pursue a relationship, then give it enough time that initial attraction will eventually, um, you know, probably wear off or certainly evolve, right? I mean, any, any married couple knows this. And other things come into play that, I, that are more related to mimetic desire, like what other people think, what other people want. So I think that we, we can't really answer the question seriously without kind of looking at it over a certain length of time, not, not in a split second, because eventually... I think Mami is always involved uh, no matter what. Something I found really interesting that you said is that uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is too neat. After a person has fulfilled their basic needs, they enter into a universe of desires that does not have a stable hierarchy. So for everyone listening, again, who's brand new, could you just, could you just explain um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how you now view that after all this work you've done? Sure. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs is, you know, very, very sort of famous pyramid of things that humans um, sort of seek, starting with the most basic, right? It makes up the, the base of the pyramid. These are, you know, basic physiological needs like food and drink. Uh, and then we move up and we seek security. You know, we, see, we seek a, a roof over our head. Um, these for kind of first two levels of the pyramid, I would call needs. Okay. Like these are just things that people, people need in order to survive, in order to be comfortable. People kind of seek them instinctually, right? Very instinctually. But then as you move up Maslow's pyramid, he starts talking about things like, uh, belonging, things like love, things like self-actualization, and all of these things um, are, you know, we, we don't, we don't, we have far less instinctual response for choosing the objects that we pursue once we get above the first two levels of the pyramid. So one way to think about this is in those first two levels of, of needs, 
we have built in biological instincts. Think of them like radars or signals that, that show us what is worth wanting in those first two levels. After that though, you know, belonging and, and all of these things and like, like emotions and all of the, all of the other things above these first two levels, there's not, our, our instincts fail us, right? They're not going to show us a specific object that we should want. So we, we rely on, on signals that are outside of ourselves, right? Because we don't have the internal wiring to tell us. I have the internal wiring to, you know, my body tells me that I'm, that I need water. If I'm dying of thirst, my body tells me that I'm hungry. If I'm starving, body tells me when I'm cold. Um, my body might tell me that I'm, that I'm, you know, lonely or, you know, or might tell, or I might feel, you know, depression or pain after I move beyond that level, but it's not going to tell me how to, how to fulfill that, that, that desire, right? It's not going to, to like have, like allow me to, to zone in on a specific thing. So I look to a world of what Gerard calls models. So these are, you know, I look to other people and what other people want to help me choose the objects after we, we move out of the, those first two levels of Maslow's hierarchy. And the, the universe of models is as big as, as there are people, right? There, there are billions of models out there. And the problem with Maslow's hierarchy then is that it, as, as you get up to the top of the pyramid towards self-actualization, you know, the, it, it, it looks as if like a person is just zeroing in, zeroing in closer and closer and closer to kind of like what they want. When in fact, it's, it's the exact opposite. Like after the first two levels, when a person has fulfilled all of their needs, there are more options than ever. And it's kind of like a Pandora's box of, of desires. So you, you could almost just cut off those first two levels and think of it as an open box of desires. Um, and thinking of Maslow's hierarchy of needs as a non-hierarchy of desire, essentially, right? It's not, there's not much of a hierarchy in those top levels is, is the important point. So it's not like we just, it's not like a video game where, you know, we, we achieve one thing and then we move on to the next thing. Um, it's not like that at all, right? It's, it's far less linear than that. And we often go through life changing, you know, different, different models, pursuing different things and not just moving necessarily moving towards this very discrete end, like the pyramid implies. So everyone knows we imitate, we imitate speech, there's mannerisms, there's all these things we imitate, but obviously we've been talking about how imitation goes to level of, of desires and imitate the desires of other people. Is there a, psychological reason a definitive reason that we can point to and say this is why we do that sure there's been a lot of books written on on the science behind this I, you know i think gerard was way ahead of the science and the science is just catching up to him in many respects right he was talking about this back in the late 50s and early 60s is when he first described mimetic desire and it wasn't until the 80s that some researchers in Italy discovered that we have something called mirror neurons, for instance. Uh, mirror neurons may be the physiological or neurological basis for this you know, crazy propensity for imitation that we have as human beings. Uh, and what a mirror neuron is, quite, quite simply, it was first discovered in monkeys in Parma, Italy. And researchers saw that when a monkey saw a person eating a gelato, for instance, the monkey's brain was hooked up to a, a machine, a highly sensitive machine that could see exactly what was happening in the monkey's brain as he was watching the human eat the gelato. And certain neurons were firing, very specific neurons fired in that monkey's brain when the monkey saw somebody eating it. And they're the same exact neurons that fire in the monkey's brain if he were eating the gelato himself. So, you know, monkey see, monkey do, right? So it means that just, just seeing other people do something triggers an imitative response in us, like a neurological response. Our brain starts firing as if we were doing this thing ourselves. 
And that seems to me to be a very strong basis for, for mimetic desire and for this natural inclination towards imitation that we have. Like, we don't necessarily even know that that's happening, that those mirror neurons are firing, but it's happening all the time. Like just seeing somebody else, um, you know, have a cold beer or, 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 or do something. If I've done that thing before, my neurons fire. It seems as if even if I haven't done the thing before, somehow, um, certain mirror neurons would fire th that would fire if I did do the thing. That's the crazy part, right? Um, so my, my brain knows things that I, I don't even have a conscious awareness of, right? It, 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 it knows what, you know, the, the neurons to fire just watching somebody do something that I've never done before. So these studies are are more robust in monkeys than they are in humans. It's, it's a little controversial or debatable, uh, the extent to which human imitation is based on mere neurons. Uh, our, our powers of imitation seem more complex than just kind of the, the, the monkey-like imitation. Monkeys, by the way, are not very good imitators. We are, we are very good imitators um, compared to monkeys. And we imitate in ways that go beyond just the external acts, like we were saying in the beginning, right? We, we can even imitate the desires. So there seems to be something even deeper going on. And you could say that that's happening on a spiritual level, on, on, some, on, a, on a psychological level. Um, we're not sure. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that humans from a very young age can read the intentions of other people and imitate those intentions. And it's unclear how we know what another person's intentions are. Hmm. Isn't that, it's kind of a, it's kind of a mysterious thing, isn't it? That, that we can read under the surface of other people. So even, even toddlers can do this and they're very good at it. Um, just to give you one other study that I think is fascinating uh, because it, it, it shines a light on how we are as adults. Uh, if you, if you show, if you show toddlers that you're trying to do something, but you, you failed to do it. So the famous study, they had like a toy dumbbell that had um, sort of foam, you know, weights on it. And you have some adults in the presence of the toddlers pretend as if they were trying to just pull the, disassemble the dumbbell, pull the ends off the dumbbell. The toddlers are watching them do this and the adults leave the room and they leave the dumbbells with the toddlers and the toddlers immediately know to just pull the, pull the ends right off the dumbbell, right? So they know, in other words, they know what the adult was trying to do, not what the adult did, right? They know they can read the intention, they can read the desire. And we simply learn how to just do this in more sophisticated ways uh, as we get older, right? Like constantly looking around at people and intuiting like, what kind of person they want to be, um, what they want, um, even if it's unspoken. And that's interesting because people sort of try to hide their true desires all the time, you know, whether it's a crush on somebody, um, you know, some people like they don't want to seem too ambitious about anything, right? Like if you're at work, you don't want to seem like you want a promotion too much because that might be frowned upon, right? So as adults, you know, nobody sort of wants to admit some of their stronger desires, right? They might only share them with their, with their closest friends. But it's happening all the time and, and we're very good at reading the, the desires and the intentions of other people. So it's almost as if everybody's playing the game where everybody's hiding their desires from everybody else, yet we're all experts at, at reading beneath the surface and sort of knowing what, what people want, right? Like people are not stupid. So that's why he called this mimesis. He said, it's, it's mimetic desire, it's mimesis, because there's this underground world of desire that nobody talks about, that explains so much mysterious human behavior, like why people get fixated on certain models of desire, um, because it's not the object that's, that's the root of the desirability. It's not the object itself that is, that is generating the desire in us. It's the model. It's the model of desire. That's the key to understanding why we want certain things. Yet nobody thinks that. Everybody thinks that it's the thing itself and nobody looks at the, the, the people mediating the desire. 
So this opens up a, a world of explaining, I think, everything from economics to relationships to politics to you know things happening in our, in our society because there's this whole underground world. I mean, we, it's almost like an iceberg, right? We see just like the, the, the tip of, of desires. These are the things that are manifested. These are the things that people talk about. But there's this whole sort of mimetic world of desires under the surface that we don't see. I think that we all know somebody in our lives that all of a sudden has a, a want or a desire to do something almost the second after you mentioned it. Um, I think we all know someone like that, but there may be people listening right now who are thinking, no way, uh, Luke Lewis, you've got it wrong. I don't, I don't uh, imitate what other people want. I'm my own person. I want my own things. That's just not me. Is there any scope? Like, is, or is there something that is in all of us, even if we don't want to admit it? I believe it's something that's, that's in all of us, um, even if we don't want to admit it. I mean, I certainly didn't for a very long time. Um, I read about mimetic desire and I thought that it applied to everybody else but me. Uh, I could see it in literally almost everybody else but me. And that's kind of a funny thing, right? Like why, why would I exempt myself of all the people, right? It's I'm the only one. Um, so I, I think that it does take a certain level of, of, of opening up and acceptance to see the way that we're from, because it's not a bad thing. I mean, like once you, if you view this as a negative um, feature of human nature, then it's understandable, right? Like uh, we all have sort of, you know, defense mechanisms and psychological blocks that I think go up because we don't typically want to want to you know, de deal with something that we think might be negative, but this is not negative. There's not mimetic desire in itself. There's nothing negative about it. It's totally neutral. Um, you know, it just means that, that our desires are, are formed and generated and shaped by other people um, in positive ways and in negative ways. Um, and there's tremendous freedom actually uh, in knowing sort of like who has been a positive influence on us and who we might want to be a positive influence on us. Um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing embarrassing about that. Um, so I think if, if, if it's seen as something negative and the, and the question is some people are like, well, how do I escape from medic desire? Uh, how do I free myself from a medic desire? I, I think and hope what they mean is like, how do I free myself from like the negative mimetic desire, like the kind that made me miserable, right? When I was, when I was a young entrepreneur. Um, but the goal is not to escape it. Uh, the goal is to harness it and channel it for, for positive things. Um, and I, so I think not seeing it as something negative is tremendously helpful in, in not exempting ourselves from it and then actually finding ways to, you know, to harness this power to do good things to achieve what we want. You mentioned earlier the romantic lie um, that when people tell you what they want, they tell you this version of the romantic lie. What is the romantic lie and how and why do we use it? Yeah, so Gerard coined this, this term, the romantic lie, um, to describe the lie that people tell themselves about why they want what they want. And it's a lie that comes from kind of romanticism, romantic idealism, kind of the, you know, the love at first sight kind of is, is an example of the romantic lie. Um, the idea that we live in a world where we alone, um, we have a romantic ideal about desire where, where, you know, I've, I've decided that, um, uh, you know, Gerard uses, you know, what, one of the examples is kind of like Julius Caesar saying, I came, I saw, I conquered. It's almost as if he's saying, you know, I, I, I came, I laid eyes on this place and I desired to conquer it. Right. And that, it, that is, is a lie because Julius Caesar is basically saying all it takes is for me to, to look at something, to know whether or not I desire it. And, you know, the, the story of that, particular battle that that he you know pursued and won um has is far more complicated there are all kinds of reasons and rivals and and you know that that's an example of of a romantic lie it's kind of the story that we tell ourselves after the fact about why we wanted something and gerard first saw this in literature he saw that in bad fiction in bad films 
and stories that are not very believable. You have characters that are, you have, well, you have authors, first of all, that, that write bad characters because they don't understand mimetic desire at all. And the characters are full of romantic lies. Like you'll have a character that just wakes out of bed in the morning and decides that they, they want to pursue some new dream or some new goal or something like that. And that character's desire seems kind of fake or inauthentic because it hasn't been like, why? It's never explained why. And the character, you know, may tell themselves all the, all of the reasons. Um, but that, that is, and it's very common that, that characters are like this in, in a lot of fiction. And Gerard said, but in the best novels, the characters always have somebody else in the story affecting what they want in some way. He said that the reason that some of these books are so popular and have stood the test of time um, are because the characters are, are mimetic because they're, they're, that's true to life. It's the way that people really are. They're not full of the romantic lie. And in a way, you know, this is actually how he first discovered mimetic desire was seeing it in, in fiction. And he said, you know, the, the reason I was able to sort of notice this phenomenon in fiction is because in our day-to-day -day lives, like we're, we're too close to it. So in a way, fiction almost like holds up, uh, holds up a mirror to reality. And sometimes we're able to see things in fiction that we don't see in our lives. And once he sort of noticed the difference between the, the romantic lie characters and the, the real characters or the characters that desired in, a, in more of a realistic way, he began to make connections and look around the world and sort of look, study history, study politics, study economics, um, and, and, and see that there was something true there that just hadn't quite been worked out. And it's not as if the authors set out to like write a book filled with mimetic desire. They didn't. They, they just somehow intuited something about the way that human desire works that the other authors have not. Yeah. One thing that I found really interesting, and I'd love for you to speak on this a little, is the relationship between desire and the quality of goal setting. Like, what are some of the things we should be conscious of when we're setting goals? The first thing is, you know, really, we should all be conscious of the system of desire that we're in, mm. the, the system of desire. So all of us are born into some system of desire. First of all, the, the very country that we're born into probably has some system of desire, right? That it's almost like, you know, uh, grooves in the snow if you ski or snowboard or anything like that, right? It's like the, the, the typical pass, right? That like down, down the mountain. So we're all born into a system in the culture that we're in. We're born into a system in, with our families, um, with the town that we grew up in uh, or the industry that we work in. And so the first thing is really just to be aware of, you know, the system and, and trying to like take a step back and seeing who are the models modeling the desirability of certain goals in this system. And are, are, is the desirability of those goals benefiting them or is it benefiting me? Or like, why, why are these things modeled as desirable in the first place? It's worth asking the question, right? Like in the U S it's, it's like, you know, you, you, you have to, you know, graduate from high school, you have to go uh, to the university. Um, you know, if you don't, you're sort of like not a serious person. And then you have, to, there's like, a, there's a whole bunch of steps that you have to take. And very few people even question the, 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 the goals, right. Or the things that they, that we've been shown that we ought to want mm. in order to be a certain kind of person. And I think now there's kind of been a reckoning where people are saying, well, wait a minute, like maybe some of the things that I've been told to want, right? Like the nice, you know, buy a nice house with the white picket fence and the dog and this, you know, maybe those things are, are have just been, uh, maybe that's a socially derived goal, right? And, and we take a step back and think. So I tell the story in the book, a perfect example about a, a chef in France and he, you know, uh, Sebastian Bra, he was born into a chef's family. His father was a very famous chef. So from the minute he was born, he was born into a system of desire of what it means to be a chef in France. And one of the things that it means to be a, a chef in France is that you 
care tremendously about what the Michelin guide has to say about your cooking has to say about your restaurant. So from a very young age, he came to desire getting Michelin stars for his father's restaurant and then eventually for his restaurant. And he slaved away. He worked his whole life to get and to keep these Michelin stars. And he's got a tremendous restaurant. I was lucky enough to eat at it because I interviewed him for the book. It's, it's tremendous. But he got to a certain point where he, he started to say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I, like, it seems as if the, the sole purpose of my restaurant and my day-to-day -day effort is on keeping my Michelin stars. And it seems like I want the stars more than I want to cook. And that's a problem, right? Like I've, I've forgotten like what it was about cooking that excited me so much in the first place. And he was miserable and he was burnt out. And he eventually did something that nobody in history had done up until this point. Uh, in 2017, he basically told Michelin not to come back to his <laughs> restaurant. And he said, listen, I don't even care about your rating. I don't want you coming back to my restaurant. I'll go without the stars. And they kind of laughed him away and said, you've got to be kidding me. Like who wouldn't want our stars? But he, he told them not to come back. And at least for that year, he, he did experience more freedom. He experienced more creativity. He got back to his roots. He started making some dishes that he, he really wanted to make and not just the dishes, not just the style of dining experience that would please the Michelin guide inspectors. Um, Unfortunately, a year later, Michelin said, well, screw you. We're just going to put you back in the guide anyway. <laughs> um, and by the way, we're going to give you two stars instead of three this time. Um, but he, he realized the system of desire that he was in. That's the point of the story. And, and he, he was able to you know, create some distance from that system, see it for what it is, see how much it had come to dominate his decision-making and negatively affect him and his, his mental health and his family and make the decision to somewhat opt out of that system. Um, not that that's always the answer, right? But, but in his case, uh, he, was, he was done and he wanted to make a pivot. So I think it's possible to objectively kind of look at some of the systems that we're in and, and the institutions or the people that are modeling the desirability of certain goals and then to question our motives, to question, you know, what, what is it that's making me want to pursue this thing yeah. um, so much? Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that because when applying that to like the world that I'm currently in, so YouTube is a, a great example. You see people start off their YouTube channel because they've got a message, they've got a meaning, there's a purpose behind it. And then I think everyone involved in the world of YouTube knows if you can get to 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, YouTube send you this plaque. It's called the, um, the, the, the play button, the silver play button. And everyone's so fixated on getting that because if you can get that, it, you know, it symbolizes that, you know, it gives you a bit of self-worth, gives you a little bit more, you know, something behind your channel. Everyone loves this idea of the play button. And you get carried into this game of metrics of almost playing the system to bring you closer to that achievement which wasn't an achievement that you really set out with in the, in the beginning i've been guilty of that in the past i just you know what metric you need to get to and you start steering away from the conversations and the topics you wanted to cover and maybe steering into the conversations and topics that you know are gonna tick those metrics along and bring you closer to that goal and it sort of takes you away from that initial desire into something completely different yeah, I, you know, I think we all have experienced that tension in our lives in some, in some form or another, right? I mean, this is um, classic artist struggle too, you know, um, for those that are musicians or writers, right? It's, it's the, the classic story of, you know, what kind of music do we make? You know, mm -hmm. do, we, do we make the music we really want to make? Do we have the kinds of conversations that we want to have? Or do we make the kind that will get us the record deal? Yeah. Or that will get us more listens. Right. Um, and, you know, this is a question that everybody I think has to think seriously about and has to answer if you are a creator, especially. Um, but this applies to everybody. But as a creator, um, you know, I've kind of gotten to a point where I'm like, um, I'm going to I'm going to write for the audience that I want, not necessarily the audience that 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 currently exists. Right. I'm just going to 
you know, not pander. Um, and I think, you know, we have to make a decision because there are trade-offs to that, you know, yeah. and the metrics um, can begin to take, the metrics are just Michelin stars. And I think that we all have a Michelin star system in our lives and we have to figure out what that is. It's just not called Michelin. <laughs> it could be called something else, but you know, we all, we all want Michelin stars and one person's Michelin star might be the YouTube plaque. Mm-hmm. And another person's Michelin star might be the verified, you know, logo next to their name on Twitter or something like that. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You know, we, we have to decide, you know, what we're going to sacrifice, you know, in order to get those things. One thing I loved at the end of the book, you talk about the Italian way to say, I love you. And it's, I want what's best for you. Why is that so powerful to you? And why did you include it in the book? Yeah. Well, I lived in Italy for, for a few years. I love Italy. Um, you know, it, it, it helped me as a sort of, you know, ambitious, busy bodied American to slow down and <laughs> learn to have, you know, long two hour lunches with a, you know, cigar break intermission in the middle. Um, you know, it was, it was, there, there were, there were so many positive things about living in Italy. And, uh, you know, I was, I learned a bit of the language and one of the things that struck me was the way that they, they say, I love you. And they say, ti voglio bene is, is how they say it, which translates literally into English, uh, as I want your good. I want what's best for you. And so they, they've embedded in the very words of, I love you is wanting what is best for somebody else. And they say that relatively, uh, I mean, they might say that to a, to a dear colleague or something like that. Right. Or to, you know, the people that they work with, um, it doesn't mean romantic love. Um, you know, in Italian, ti voglio bene, it's like a, a term of affection. And so it's more, it's more widely used than, then you or I would say, I love you, right? It'd be weird if we said, I love you <laughs> to as many people as they do. But I found it beautiful because it, it really encapsulates a core idea. And it's true. Like lo- love is desiring what's best for another person. Um, even if, um, you know, and, and putting that ahead of our own desires, maybe for that person or something like that, right? So there's that, and this is an incredibly hard lesson. It took me many years to learn. Kind of like one of the greatest acts of love is is to to kind of like let somebody go in a sense and just and just to want what's best for them, even if even if you had different ideas, right? I mean, this is the case with with you know, sometimes in a painful breakup or something like that, right? Like real love is is, is really realizing that like you know may, maybe I'm not the best person for this person or something, and, and and even though I love them, even though I would like to be with them, it's 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 I, I love them so much I want what's best for them, but this. I think really applies to every, every relationship, not just romantic relationships, every area in life. Um, you know, I look at my colleagues, I look at my em- employees and rather than thinking like, what, what, what can they do that's best for my organization, my company, my interest, I want what's best for them. Even if, even if that means that they they need to leave to, to go, to go do something else. Right. So in this phrase is embedded, there's an aspect of freedom here. There, there's an, there's a, there's a, there's a really important point about giving other people the, the freedom to, to pursue things and to do what's best for them and not imposing my desires onto them. And, it's really hard to do that, right? It's really hard to just give give people the the same autonomy that we would want for ourselves. Um, and this kind of comes back to like do do unto others what what you would want them to do to you. We all would want people to to not impose their desires on onto us. Um, but it's it's a lot harder for us, I think, to to give that freedom to other people. To quick fire questions to finish that i ask every guest that comes on the show regardless of the topic the first one we've talked all about your book today uh, wanting which is going to impact so many people's lives but what i want to know is what books have you read in your life that have had a massive impact on yourself Hmm. 
so you know, anti-fragile by by Nassim Nicholas Taleb has been a, a, a highly influential book in my life. Um, I use the word anti-mimetic in my book to sort of describe um, a, a way of being, a way of thinking that's that's resists some of the negative mimetic effects. And uh, you know that that idea came from Taleb's in anti-fragile. Right, he was trying to find a word that was the opposite of fragile. Um, that book is incredible. I mean, it's, I think it's just brilliant um, and and just full of insights that I'm still working out. And it's very practical um, and gave me some heuristics that I that I was able to implement in my life. So I, I think that book was a huge inspiration for me and, and also just even in the style and the form of, of my book. Um, and, um, you know, just to give you one more um, sort of a, a bit of a different, a different book um, would be uh let's see i think that i started reading classic literature later in life i didn't take it seriously when i was in school yeah uh, i mean the books were assigned to me and i i would just say that i read them and i didn't uh but then later in life i realized how much wisdom is and, and truth about human nature and life is embedded are, are embedded in them so I read um, The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky when I was in my late 20s for the very first time. And um, it, it, it was on a, on a spiritual level, um, the book changed my life. Um, it sort of like made, made me, first of all, you know, it's one of the books that Gerard talks about where the characters are, are highly realistic in terms of mimetic desire. Um, but I read the book before I knew what mimetic desire was. And I just, I, I saw in that book a level of spiritual depth that I've been craving and um, sort of led me down a journey that took me to where I am today. Amazing. The last question I have for you could be anything, could be your work, could be your friends, could be your family, could be whatever. But right now for Luke Burgess, what makes a life worth living? Uh, being relationships it's it's a hundred percent just cultivating deep loving relationships in my life um i sacrificed some relationships early in my career and didn't spend enough time with the people that i loved um and i just got married five weeks ago oh, so congratulations uh, you know, that's thank you very much so that's a big one for me and um you know i, I think what what is what is any achievement if, if, if i don't have anybody to share it with um, if i don't have people in my life. I mean, I think when I look back on my life, you know, on my deathbed, it's the relationships that will be the most important things. So certainly with my wife, with, with my friends, um, you know, with my parents who are, are there, you know, I'm, I'm an only child. I'm very close to my parents. Um, they're getting older um, and just sort of cherishing the, um, you know, the, the, the time that I have with them, uh, you know, is, is th those are the things that, um, that are always most satisfying to me are those late night conversations um, and, and just being with the people that I love. Beautifully put my friend wanting the book. If anyone needs any more convincing there's two testimon testimonials on you from Adam Grant and Jonathan Haidt. Um, can't get much better than that in terms of testimonial. So the book will be in the description below if anyone wants to click on the link and check out a copy. Uh, Luke, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Thanks so much, Lewis. My pleasure.